Well, welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast again. We're going to do something a little bit different today. Uh, a lot of you, since we've started this podcast, have written in with questions, either on Instagram, YouTube, email, however you sent them in, we got them. So I thought what we do today is there's a lot of questions that kind of cluster, and I'm going to try to answer them the best I can, and I hope you have fun with this. I'm certainly going to have fun because I love to see what you guys want to know. So we're going to start with some YouTube questions, and uh, should, I, should I read the names? I guess it's okay. Everybody, uh, if you uh, I apologize if we read your name, and I'm sure I'll fracture it, so I apologize with that. Uh, first one comes from Mark Heinrich. I guess that's right. I just found you and think your research is very interesting. So, I'm definitely going to buy your book, and thank you, Mark, and let's move on to the next question. No. <laughs> However, I am very confused about the olive oil theory. If you check out Olive Oil is Not Healthy by Michael Clapper, MD, I'm wondering why the opinion between you and him are so different. Would you please explain? Thank you. Uh, that is actually a great question. And I think the question really comes from, there are a number of, uh, extremely well-meaning physicians who uh, cluster in the no-fat vegan school of dietary recommendations. And then there are the rest of us who think that there are certain fats that not only are not bad for you, but are actually incredibly beneficial. And I think one of the big confusions, this actually began back in the 1950s when uh, Dr. Uh, President Dwight Eisenhower suffered a heart attack. And there was consternation as how this you know, incredibly fit, relatively young individual who you know, was the general for World War II how did he get heart disease? And so they actually uh, wanted to know the best person to advise him. And so that best person was a researcher at the University of Minnesota by the name of Ansel Keys. Now, Keys created the K ration in World War II, uh, hence the K. So Dr. K Dr. Keys was appointed to tell Dwight Eisenhower how he got heart disease. So he was in the process of studying nutrition, that was actually his field, and he did a series of uh, epidemiologic studies that was eventually published in the early 1970s as the Seven Countries Study. Now, the Seven Countries Study actually caused the fat is bad for you movement. And in fact, it caused the United States government with the McGovern Commission, yes, that McGovern, George McGovern, the formal presidential candidate, to state that dietary fat was the cause of heart disease. And that uh, recommendation prevailed for well over 30 years. In fact, it continues to this day. Now, Dr. Keyes, uh, I've studied extensively. I've read every one of his articles. I've dissected them with a fine-tooth comb. And what Dr. Keyes was actually trying to say was he looked at animal fats, saturated fats from animals. And he made a correlation in these seven countries that the more saturated fats from animals that people eat the more heart disease. Now, interestingly enough, Dr. Keyes wrote a paper many years ago that said that dietary cholesterol has nothing to do with serum cholesterol. And that's somehow missed in all of Dr. Keyes' writings. He did not uh, say that dietary cholesterol was bad for you at all. In fact, he said just the opposite. It had no effect on cholesterol. But he was quite adamant that Saturated fat from animals was bad. Now, the people who pick him apart, primarily from the paleo community and the ketogenic community, said, no, no, no. 
Dr. Keyes was a cherry picker. And he took the worst seven countries, and in his study, he was actually looking at 21 countries. And he threw out all the other countries that didn't match his data. And so that's why he called it the seven country study. But there have been other people, particularly Denise Menger, who have re-looked at his data with modern statistical analysis and found, in fact, that Dr. Keyes was pretty right in that if you threw in all those other 21 countries, the overall trend would show that animal saturated fats impact health. Now, in my new book, which will be out in March, called The Longevity Paradox, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about what Dr. Keyes knew, what he didn't know, and what we should take away from that information. And I, in the book, you know, come not to bury Dr. Keyes, but to actually praise him. And here's why I praise him. Dr. Keyes never said that fat was a problem. What he said was that animal fat was a problem. And in fact, interestingly enough, Dr. Keyes, when he retired from the University of Minnesota, retired to a little village south of Naples, Italy, where he lived right next to the village called Acciaroli, which has the oldest percentage of people in the world. It was not mentioned in the Blue Zones because uh, Dan Brutner didn't know about it, but they have more people over 100 years of age. 30% of the population is over 100 than any place in the world. And Dr. Keyes lived right next to that village. And I think he lived there not by accident, by, but by choice. And I've actually had the opportunity to interview Dr. Key's housekeeper, and he ate a huge amount of olive oil, as you would anticipate someone who moved to the south of Italy. So rather than demonizing oils, Dr. Keyes actually wanted people to realize that there was a difference between animal saturated fat and plant-based fats, particularly monounsaturated fats like olive oil. So that's a long-winded way of saying that the father of anti-fat was not anti-fat at all. Now, unfortunately, my colleagues of the anti-fat have really not looked at the data that Dr. Key assembled, nor at the data that's been done before. So let's get back to olive oil. If you look at Dr. Clapper's videos, he'll tell you that olive oil is full of fat. Uh, yeah, duh. Olive oil is fat, and he says that fat makes you fat. Well, if we've learned anything from the ketogenic movement, we know that in fact, fat does the exact opposite. Fat does not make you fat. Carbohydrates make you fat. Give you an example. Years ago, after World War II, the United States had a lot of coconut available to us after we took over or liberated a lot of the Philippines, a lot of Indonesia, and we had a lot of pigs to feed. And interestingly enough, it seems like, well, we've got a lot of coconuts, and coconuts are pretty much pure fat, so we ought to use those coconuts to fatten pigs for market. Sounds like a great idea, and incidentally, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska during those times. More coconut we fed to pigs, the skinnier the pigs got. The skinnier they got, not the fatter they got, even though we were basically feeding them pure fat. Well, we're not pigs, you say. Well, actually, we carry the same metabolic digestive system that pigs do. So if you want to call your loved one a big fat pig, you're actually speaking the truth. So what is it about olive oil that's so evil then? Well, in fact, there was a study in Spain that was published just a couple years ago. And what they did was they took 65-year-old people and they divided them into three groups, all of whom ate a Mediterranean diet. The first group had to use a liter of olive oil per week. Now, that's a huge amount of olive oil. My wife and I try to use a, a liter per week. We usually get there, but that's about 12 to 14 tablespoons a day. They actually 
had them come to the clinic once a week, exchange their liter of olive oil for a new bottle, and that's how they knew they were doing it. The second group had to eat a Mediterranean diet, but they had used the same calories of raw walnuts as the olive oil group. The third group had a low-fat Mediterranean diet, exactly what Dr. Clapper would recommend. But they had to eat the same calories, which means they had to get those calories from primarily carbohydrates. So they were followed for four years. The original purpose of the study was to look at memory. At the end of four years, both the walnut oil group, oh, sorry, the walnut group and the olive oil group had preserved memory. In fact, both of those groups had improved memory over four years earlier. Now, think about that, just let that sink in. So at 69, two of those groups had better memory than when they were 65. And that obviously goes against what we think about aging. The low fat group, on the other hand, had diminished memory. In other words, they followed what we would assume to be the normal trajectory of getting older. So the fat group, either olive oil or walnuts, their brain was better. The low fat group, their brain was worse. Now it gets even more interesting. They said, hey, we got a lot of data on a lot of people. Let's see what else is interesting. So they broke down cardiovascular disease. And at the end of four years, lo and behold, the olive oil group had the best outcomes in avoiding cardiovascular disease. That means stroke, heart attacks, stents, bypass surgery, or peripheral vascular disease. The walnut group was right behind them. And guess what? The low-fat group came in last. They had the most cardiovascular disease compared to the other two groups. But it gets even better than that. Women were followed for breast cancer. And it turns out that only the olive oil group had a 67% less risk of breast cancer than the other two groups. The low-fat group did the worst. So wait a minute, we've got all these people eating all this fat, I mean, a liter of olive oil per week, that's a huge amount of calories, and yet they do better on every outcome. But here's the best part. The olive oil group lost the most weight they actually lost weight over the four years, even though they were forced, the poor devils, to drink 12 to 14 tablespoons of olive oil per day. The low fat group gained weight during those four years, even though they weren't eating the fat. So when somebody tells you that fat is fat and fat makes you gain weight, uh, I've got some oceanfront property in Palm Springs to sell you. It absolutely isn't true. And that goes to the theory that calories in equals calories out, and that the only way you can gain weight is to either eat less calories or exercise more. And we know for a fact that that is actually not true because it never accounts for the bacteria in our gut, microbiome, eating anything, okay? So the point is, olive oil is one of the best sources for polyphenols, and if you watch me long enough, you know that polyphenols are actually what's gonna make the difference in your health. So I'll say it again, the only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth, and Ansel Keys was right. Okay, uh, Anthony Fernando. Waiting to read your next book. When will it be released? Well, that's a great question too. And the good news is it's not just one book, it's two books right in a row. We've had so much response to the Plant Paradox and the Plant Paradox cookbook. And we've had literally millions of people adopt this style of eating or want to adopt this style of eating. But it's 
challenging. And if any of you have read The Plant Paradox, you know it's quite a thick academic book in a way. So we wanted to make it quick and easy. And so on January 9th, we're going to introduce a paperback, first time I've done a paperback, in The Plant Paradox, Quick and Easy. And so it's going to be a 30-day challenge. And I'm actually really excited about this. We are going to give you 30 day days of meals. We've got all new recipes for you that's really fun. And we're going to give you a quick start on how to do this. And particularly, we want to make this easy for families. Uh, you noticed in the Plant Paradox Cookbook that we're really interested in helping, you know, three job families, you got two or three kids that you got to get to 27 soccer games and football practices and whatever else, and you don't have time. So this is really aimed at making it easy for you, quick and easy. And at the same time, we really want to start a challenge. You're going to see it on social media. You can join in on the challenge. So look for it. It's coming very shortly, right after the holidays. And why not? It's the time when we all want to make a change. On the heels of that book, in, on March 19th, I think, uh, I'm releasing The Longevity Paradox, How to Die Young at a Ripe Old Age. And this is the culmination of 20 years of research of my own and many other people looking at the factors that actually make us continue to be incredibly young at an incredibly old age. And unlike the blue zones, and we'll get to that question in a minute, there are actually factors in the blue zones that were not mentioned that are actually the causes of longevity. And you're going to be really surprised, but if you know me as well as you know, the gut microbiome actually determines how long you'll live. And let me just give you a little teaser on that. It turns out, if you look at people 105 years of age or older, and look at their gut microbiome, the type of bacteria that are living in their guts, their microbiome is virtually identical to 30-year-old people. And it's that identical thing that doesn't exist in most people as they age. So the whole book is going to teach you how to keep your gut microbiome young, and that microbiome is going to teach you to stay young because you're their home. And that's the whole principle of the book. It's a paradox how to get old but stay young. So stay tuned for both of those. Okay, uh, Jocelyn Posenecker. Dr. Gundry, please ad address uh, red palm oil. Is it organic? I love the taste so much. So there's two types of palm oils out there. There's palm oil and then there's red palm oil. Red palm oil should be better called palm fruit oil. So a date, everybody knows a date, palms make dates. And just like an olive, we know that olive oil is made from the fruit of the olive and we press that fruit and that gives us olive oil. But coming out of that fruit is the polyphenols that actually give olive oil its benefit. Now you can actually make olive oil out of the seed, the pit of the olive, and it's technically called pumice, P-U-M-I-C-E. It's really an industrial oil. Uh, a lot of bad olive oil is cut with pumice because it really doesn't have a whole lot of health benefit. Same way with palm oil. The fruit of the palm tree is pressed and it has a very red color. The reason it has a very red color is that it's full of vitamin E, the tocotrienols and the tocopherols. And there's actually about five different forms of each of these forms of vitamin E. And there's huge health benefits to alpha tocopherol and gamma tocopherol as well as del delta tocopherol. And 
I won't bore you with the details, but it's these various fragments that are in red palm oil or palm fruit oil that aren't present in palm oil. Palm oil is the kernel. So whenever you see palm oil, you think, eh, that's the inferior stuff and I want to stay away from that. Red palm oil, on the other hand, has some really interesting health benefits, including it's actually shown to really reduce the chance of cancer. In fact, in all of my cancer patients, I have them use a preparation of red palm oil as one of their daily supplements. So, big difference between the two. Now, there's a proviso with all this. Palm oil is uh, very lucrative to sell, and there is tremendous deforestation in Indonesia, in the Philippines, as rainforests are mowed down and palm trees are planted. So use this sparingly. It is not something that every day you want to say, wow, the more red palm oil I can have, the better. Olive oil, on the other hand, nobody is chopping down rainforests to plant olive trees. There's plenty of olive trees that are over 5,000 years old. In fact, I visited one in Sicily uh, last week. So stay with olive oil, supplement with red palm oil. Please stay away from palm oil as much as possible. Slim land one. If I would have to take a shot every time he says gut, well, you're probably watching one of my videos or one of my lectures where I talk about the gut. And if anything you've learned so far, I learned from Hippocrates. And Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut. And he said that 2,500 years ago. And research means look again. Uh, the definition of research is look again, because somebody actually already knew this. And so when I started researching, it turns out Hippocrates knew that everything began in the gut 2,500 years ago. So I apologize for saying gut, but since you're going to have a shot every time I say gut, I want you to have a shot of olive oil every time you watch that video and I say gut. And you'll probably get up to about 12 to 14 tablespoons a day. Okay, perfect. So let's all roll that video. All right, Derek Carlton. Uh, has your position towards coconut oil changes uh, changed any since the Harvard professor declared it to be poison during her lecture? Um, this is the problem between people who literally misinterpreted Ansel Keys' demonizing fat. He did not demonize fat. He demonized animal fat. And this all comes down to that original pronouncement way back in the 1950s. You should also know that in the 1950s, because we had so much coconut oil coming into this country because we had inherited or liberated you know, thousands of coconut farms, that this country in the 1950s was flooded with coconut oil. Now it was actually hydrogenated coconut oil. We took coconut oil and saturated it even more so that it would be solid at all temperatures. Uh, if you live in Palm Springs, you know that coconut oil in the summer is a liquid. And once it hits about 72 degrees, or below 72 degrees, it'll become solid. So I had the interesting pleasure of growing up in the same neighborhood as a young lady whose last name is Sokoloff. And her father had a heart attack in the 19, when he was 40. And he blamed his heart attack on coconut oil that he was eating. And he was actually a fairly uh, well-to-do gentleman. And he took out a campaign to demonize coconut oil. I can still remember uh, chatting with his daughter, who was a little embarrassed by her father. But uh, Mr. Sokolov was the beginning of demonizing coconut oil. Now, 
How did that catch on? Well, it turns out that our manufacturers in the United States had lots of vegetable oils. We had tons of soybean oil, cottonseed oil, corn oil, and coconut oil competed directly with what we produced. And so it's no surprise to me, having been the president of the American Heart Association for the Southern California area for two years, that the American Heart Association would wholeheartedly jump right in against coconut oil because Dr. Keyes said that saturated fats were evil in the cause of heart disease and that unsaturated fats were great. So the long story short is the demonization of coconut oil really has very little basis in truth. Now, having said that, we're going to get to a question about apoe 4s and when we do, you folks with apoe 4 stay tuned, because I'm going to tell you, tr please try to avoid coconut oil. Uh, Mark Pexson. Hello, Dr. Gundry. If beans are so bad, how come they are a common food in the blue zone populations? Oh, this is my favorite myth of the blue zones. It's really one of the great myths, and I'll tell you, because I was pr pr a professor in one of the blue zones, Loma Linda, California, for most of my career. So, are the blue zones eat, actually eating, be eating beans? Well, let's start with Okinawan. The Okinawan diet was studied in 1949 by the US military. In fact, the only published data on what Okinawans ate when Okinawans were long lived was published by the US military. And in fact, the Okinawan diet was 85% was purple sweet potatoes. 85% of what they ate was a sweet potato. 6% of their diet was white rice, and 6% of their diet was soy that was misu. It was fermented soy. They didn't eat tofu. They didn't eat brown rice. The other part of their diet was actually lard from pork. So, 85% of a blue zone diet had nothing to do with beans. Let's talk about Loma Linda. Loma Linda uses a form of soybeans that's called texturized vegetable protein, TVP. It's defatted soy that is pressure extruded under high heat to make what we called mystery meat. We had every possible meat look-alike. We had wham, which was spam. We had chicken, we had shrimp. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you a quick funny story. We had a Christmas party one year at a local hotel uh, in Loma Linda and a large buffet. And my partner, Leonard Bailey, and our wives were sitting together and Dr. Bailey came back from the buffet line and bit into a shrimp, and he turned to his wife, he says, you know, it's amazing that you can make TVP taste just like a shrimp. And she said, you moron, that is a shrimp. And he says, oh, and of course, finished it. But the point of all this is the Adventists don't use beans, they use pressure and heat pressurized beans, which is exactly what I tell you to do. If you want to eat beans, and I have nothing against beans as long as you detoxify their lectins by pressure cooking. So if you look at other cultures, for instance, the Greeks, the Sardinians, the Sardinians actually don't eat a whole lot of beans, the Greeks definitely do, but the work that was done uh, in food and Western disease actually shows that the beans and the grains in the Mediterranean diet are a negative factor that are actually compensated for by all the polyphenols in their diet from red wine, from olive oil, from fruits and vegetables. And oh, by the way, in the Mediterranean diet, you peel and de-seed your peppers, you peel and de-seed your tomatoes, you peel and de-seed your cucumbers. 
and I just got back from Sicily where every chef there that I interviewed confirmed that there is no human way that you should eat a tomato without peeling and de-seeding it first. Everybody knows that. So the bean theory of the blue zones is unfortunately not compatible with the facts. Uh, story spotlight. What about bananas and pineapple? pineapples? I'm confused about them. Also, what about citrus fruits like oranges? Well, bananas, when they're green, are actually one of the best resistant starches there are. Your gut bugs absolutely love them. There's green banana flour that you can buy that we use in some of our recipes. Pineapples do have bromelain, which is actually a very excellent um, enzyme for digesting fats and carbohydrates. But pineapples have a ton of sugar, particularly if you allow them to ripen. The other problem with pineapples and bananas is that they are picked green and then shipped to this country, and they actually have a much higher lectin content than if they were actually picked ripe. So green bananas, perfectly safe. They're fine for you. In fact, use them as much as possible. The easiest way is if it starts turning yellow, you're kind of out of luck. Peel them, throw them in a freezer, and then throw them in a smoothie to thicken it. It's actually a great way to feed your bugs. But in general, those are not a great idea. Citrus fruits. So limes and lemons are perfectly safe. There's so little sugar content in either of these, and they have some excellent polyphenols. It turns out if you're going to eat citrus, the best part of the citrus is either the rind or the peel. And one of the best liver detoxifiers there is is orange peel. And one of my products, in fact, liver support system, actually uses orange peel, it's called D-limonene, to up your detoxification enzymes in your liver. So, citrus is available. Believe it or not, citrus is a man-made invention. It was hybridized. There was not any ancient citrus trees. So it's actually a very modern fruit. Okay, we got some emails. Judy writes, you mentioned sourdough bread in your book. Can we make healthy sourdough bread, and if so, how? This, uh, I can't tell you how many times uh, I am told by my patients or people who write in that you said on Dr. Oz that sourdough bread is perfectly safe. Now, I saw Dr. Oz and his wife this past weekend, and uh, he says hello, everybody, and he's looking forward to the new season. What Dr. Oz, when I appeared on his show, and we're very old friends, he said, you know I am a big fan of grains. And I said, yes, I know, and I'm trying to convince you otherwise. He says, well, you gotta, you gotta throw me a bone, and you gotta give me something that people, if they're gonna eat grains, and if they're gonna believe me, that they can eat. And I'm going, ah, no. I said, well, okay, here's the deal. If, food, if breads are made in the traditional style with true fermentation of the grain by either bacteria or yeast or a combination like sourdough, then that fermentation process is going to denature a number of the lectins in that bread. And it will, of bad things, be safer for you than if you made bread in the American style, which has actually no fermentation. Modern breads in America are actually raised without yeast. So we agreed to compromise, and in, in a way I wish I'd never said that, and I wish I'd never put it in the book, because a lot of people who have autoimmune disease assume they're safe eating sourdough bread. And I can tell you when they do that, we can see their autoimmune disease or their celiac disease or their irritable bowel come right back up. So the short answer is please don't eat sourdough bread. If you're going to eat a bread and, you know, ignore me, 
then sourdough bread done the traditional way, not bought in a supermarket pre-sliced, is probably the safest of the breads, but the only reason you're going to eat sourdough bread is to get olive oil into your mouth. And that's what the Italians do, and I saw that again in Sicily, they only tear off a piece of bread to soak up olive oil. I actually, once again, never saw any of the Sicilians eat bread as a food, they ate it to sop up olive oil. Okay? All right. Alfredo writes, I exercise five to six days a week and compete in marathons and triathlons. I started to follow your diet as I was recovering from an injury. As I increased the exercise workload, however, I felt constantly hungry. I do my best to avoid the just say no foods, but it is a daily struggle to fight all the cravings. What do you recommend? Uh, well, one of the things I could tell you is to become a gorilla. And I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but a gorilla uh, eats 16 pounds of leaves every day. And I got news for you, a gorilla has more muscle than you and I will ever have. A chimpanzee, all they eat is leaves. And as you know, a chimpanzee can pull a door off of a car, and you can't, and I can't, well, maybe you can. Uh, also, a horse, all a horse eats is grass, and horse has more muscle than you will ever have. There's a myth that's been perpetrated by the Department of Agriculture that we have to have animal protein in our diet. Now remember, the Department of Agriculture is in the business of selling agricultural products. They're not in the health business. And again, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, and believe me, you know, steak for breakfast, a side of beef for lunch, and a whole hog for dinner. And that, unfortunately, is not how to remain healthy for long. And you'll learn in the longevity paradox that just the opposite is true. So what do I recommend? And I take care of a lot of athletes. I take care of actually a number of NFL players who follow my program and do it well. You can get all the calories you need from resistant starches. And the wonderful thing about resistant starches is they will fill you up. So you want to have a bunch of yams or sweet potatoes. You want to have a lot of millet or sorghum. You want to have a lot of jicama. Have a good time. You can have sorghum, quote, oatmeal for breakfast. You can have millet oatmeal for breakfast. But please pour some olive oil on it. You can make my waffles or pancakes and drench them in olive oil, and I guarantee you, you will be full. If that doesn't do it, make some plantain pancakes from the book. I guarantee you, you'll be full. So fill up on resistant starches, fill up on leaves. Uh, I eat mixing bowls full of salads, and I never am hungry. So that's how to do it. Uh, are there any gels like goo that you recommend to take while doing long runs 10 to 24 miles? Yeah, so here's the trick I do with uh, my athletes. First of all, I tell them don't run that far. Um, and you saw in my previous books, and you're going to see in the longevity paradox, that long runs are a really good way to damage your heart. Really. The evidence is overwhelming that running beyond about six miles causes damage to your right ventricle and it will cause scar tissue and it will cause arrhythmias as you get older. And my wife, who was a marathoner, who ran the 100th running of the Boston Marathon, qualified and finished, she, when I showed her the data, hung up her spikes and has never run those sort of distances again. Having said that, lots of people use running as an endorphin rush, and I understand that. I take care of a lot of runners. So if you want to do, a, need a gel to take in long runs, buy coconut oil packets. They're available at Trader Joe's. They're available in health food stores. You can get them online. There's, I think, now five manufacturers of them. You will get a big blast of ketones. They come in a tear open uh, foil package. Uh, when Tony Robbins and I started working together, Tony would do 18 hour days, seven days a week on stage. 
and we got them through those long days by coconut oil packets. So it's a great trick. Uh, okay, so I'll tell you what. We've hit a lot of subjects. We've got more to do, and I promise you, because you've been so nice of you know, sending me these in, we'll do another podcast answering your questions. So, this is the Dr. Gundry podcast. I appreciate you listening. I hope you've learned a few things. If you're, if you're interested in learning more about Annabelle's book, which is on our other podcast, you can head over to drgundry.com. And I'll see you on the next podcast. Thanks. Bye.